Oh, that's it. Come on. Come on. There you go. You ready to go? You ready to go. Okay. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, today we're very lucky because it's Q&A, but not just any Q&A, it's special edition. Sis edition, because I challenged my sister to go ask her friends how many questions they have and send them in, so I'd add mixed her questions and her friends' questions in with ones that our viewers sent in. So here we go. Lots of, lots of questions. First of all, this is a good, this is one from a doctor friend. I developed symptoms even though I've been vaccinated and double boosted. Turned out I was positive, so I took a course of Paxlovid. Symptoms improved, everything was good, but once I stopped, symptoms recurred and I was positive again. What should I do? Well, this happens every now and then because Paxlovid, remember, knocks down your viral burden, but if you're, it takes five to seven days for you to get a maximum immune response, and if you only take a course for five days and you haven't quite developed a full immune response, then it's very possible that your viral burden, your viral load increases again, you get symptomatic. In that case, the right thing to do is take a second dose. Now, that's not standard, but that's what it should happen, do a second five-day uh, course. There have been studies looking at five and 10 days for prophylaxis, and it, the main thing is if you take 10 days, it's no extra symptoms, no problem. So if you can get your doctor to give you a second course, that's what I would do. Okay, another question. I'm running out of test kits. Of course you are, because you're testing every day. What should I do? Well, the federal government just said, order it. You can get eight more free uh, COVID virus tests. The uh, at-home kits, you just go to covid.gov forward slash tests and request them and you'll have a bunch more. So, you know, and it's a good idea to have them around because, you know, as you go to events and stuff, you might want to test it. Okay, this is another good question. Based on all the research that have gone before, the COVID vaccines were developed very qu quickly. Why is it taking so much longer to come up with the next generation of vaccines? You know, uh, why is it saying, it seems like it's being stalled somehow in the midst. So what's going on? Well, that's actually a, a really good question. And I think there's two things. The first, remember in the beginning, the federal government prepaid. So that took away all the, the financial risks. Uh, that's not happening anymore. And the second thing is the speed is based a lot on how many cases are out in the community. So it's very easy to put together a phase three trial if everybody's getting infected. Now, you know, people have been vaccinated. It's a little harder and it takes a little bit longer to assemble uh, both the control group and the, and the um, treated group. So it's taking a little bit of time, but it's a good question. Some of the, the second generation ones don't have the federal funding that the first, uh, first round did. Uh, and f so for example, if you look at Peter Hotez's vaccine, he didn't go through all that because it was licensed in India and all they had to do was show equivalent immune response. Uh, so, you know, it's taking a little bit of time, but hopefully we'll get some, some new ones. Another follow up on that was what's the status of Novavax? Well, Novavax submitted their request to the FDA for emergency use in January. They're supposed to uh, review it in June. Uh, so it's already in use in many countries in Europe and Canada. And it's, it's thought to be highly effective, simpler to take. And like Peter Hotez's vaccine, it can be stored in refrigerators. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. Um, we think the CEO, the CEO of Novavax also said that they're going to update that uh, vaccine with an Omicron specific uh, target. Uh, soon. So I think Novavax will come in. It might be a good second generation vaccine. Here's one <laughs> from the Janus friends. See, my convalescent plasma was a bust, but now everybody seems to be looking uh, for more plasma. What's, what's this about? Well, actually, uh, it didn't really work out in the time of Delta. It's not really approved. So I don't know who's asking for a lot of plasma, but uh, it must be an experimental study because there really hasn't been used. It hasn't been recommended for use in Delta or even in Omicron. So maybe there's a study going on, but I'm not sure what's going on with that. Uh, another uh, one of Janet's friends, the New York Times quoted the CDC as saying more than half of all Americans have been infected by COVID at least once. How do they know? <laughs> That's a New Yorker question. How do they know? <laughs> well, they know because <laughs> we've done prevalence studies. So remember, we, we talked about this before, but the only way to really know who's been infected is to draw their blood, measure to see if they have antibodies and you can tell antibodies to the vaccine because it's just the spike protein versus antibodies to the whole virus. They have other antibodies. So you can tell how many people have been infected if you do a prevalence study. Well, the few prevalence studies have, that have been done show that probably two to three times more people have been infected than we know uh, for known cases. So in the United States right now, there are 83 million known cases. You multiply that to two or three, you get like, you know, 160 or 200 million. 
There are only 325 million people in the United States, so that's over half. That's how they know. It's pre the prevalence studies that have been done, and then the, mo the known cases. Here's one. What's the uh, story with Sabazabulin? Uh, has it been fast-tracked? When will it be available? Uh, there was a New York Times article in April. What, what's going on with that? So it's a really interesting, a really interesting drug. Uh, we talked about it a little bit before. It inhibits the sort of uh, structural architecture of cells. It's a cytoskeleton disruptor. So it's very, for a virus to replicate, it has to go through and navigate a, a cell, and it's got to be, you know, an intact cell. And if it's all disrupted because the ar architecture is disrupted, then it's very difficult for the virus to get the right place to be replicating. So it, it's very effective, 82 percent uh, reduction in death, 73 percent um, reduction in uh, days in the ICU versus placebo. So very exciting, uh, likely drug, that new drug. It, it, we think it's going to be, um, it's a request for emergency use is planned for submission uh, later this year. So I think we'll be seeing that as another new drug on the market. So that's really good. <laughs> here's, a, here's a cynical question. Uh, does a mask provide any substantive protection if everyone around you is not wearing a mask? So, you know, I feel this way too. When I'm wearing a mask and no one's around, what is, you know, what's the benefit of that? Well, we reviewed that data fairly early on. There was a big study that looked at the number of people who turned positive, and, the, and then they said they compared it to people who were wearing masks who, you know, didn't turn positive. And this was published in the MMWR sometime last year. What it basically showed is that if you looked, and this was a study of about five or 600 people, you can reduce the uh, chance of being positive if you wear a cloth mask by 56%. If you wear a surgical mask, it reduces the chance of getting infected by 66%. And if you wear a respirator, the one, an N95 mask that's well fitted, 83%. So remember, early on in the pandemic, you know, doctors are wearing N95s and not getting infected. So you can protect yourself, you know, from people. You, you just have to have the guts to wear it. And when people, you know, start booing you and stuff, just keep wearing your mask. I do it all the time. I have no problem doing it. I went to the theater the other day. They said, please wear your mask. No one was wearing masks except for me, you know, and my wife, and five other people. I assume the rest of them all are infected. Okay, here's, here's a, this is a great New York question. This is how you know it's from New York. <laughs> Why is Clyde the Glide Frazier still really cool? Well, I don't, I don't know, but he is really cool. Look at this. Look what he wears. He was the coolest point guard that the Knicks ever had. And he's like, 20 years later, he's still the coolest guy in New York. So I have no idea why, but I'm not sure how that's COVID related, but that's, that's my sister. She's a big Knicks fan, by the way. Okay. My husband will be 60 in August and I'm 52, so we both qualify for the second booster. Should we get it now or might it be better to wait until the fall? Well, I've mentioned this before. I think the time to get it is now because if you look at the community rates in Harris County, they're beginning to go up. So the important thing is to look at your community rates and decide based on that. If it's low risk, you're okay. If it's beginning to go up to moderate risk, time to get your booster. Okay. Can you comment on the current COVID antivirals? Okay, well, we've talked about this last one, but here are the ones that are currently approved. Molnupiravir, which is the one that was first introduced uh, that causes mutations in the virus that, that hopefully prevent it from being successfully replicating. Remdesivir, which is a nucleotide analog, uh, also inhibits the, uh, the polymerase. And then Paxlovoid, the protease. Those are the three that have been approved. The best one by far is, uh, is the protease inhibitor Paxlovid. And so that's the main one to get. As I mentioned, it's been approved for a dose of five. If you're symptomatic, you can always, you can get it. It's not as widely available as it should be, but you should get it. And right, right now they're reluctant to give second doses. But in that case that I mentioned, the first question, you know, in that case, sometimes you need two doses. Uh, here's a tough one from uh, one of our viewers. We want to travel with a group of people, most over 60, with serious health conditions. <laughs> it's already a bad idea, but that's okay. The group includes a younger couple in their 50s and 40s, both who oppose COVID vaccines. Can the younger couple join our group with unduly, uh, without unduly endangering, endangering everyone else? Can they visit my husband and me for two weeks this summer without too much risk? What would you do? Okay, this is... This is not the one, this is not going to be the politically favorable question, answer to this. The first thing is, let's take the trip. You're going to go on a trip with a bunch of people who are at high risk. Uh, I think that's okay if they're all vaccinated and doubly boosted. I would require that everyone probably get a PCR negative test before they all get together to go on that group trip. 
uh, and you probably should assign somebody to make sure that everyone follows the rules. As for inviting the couple that's against vaccines, I'd say no. And I wouldn't have them come over. I mean, I just don't think you should have non-vaccinated people traveling with a group of high risk folks. So I don't know if it's your kid or friends, but the answer is I, I'd just say no. I sound like Nancy Reagan, just say no. Uh, I plan again on second booster in the, uh, all my shots uh, have been Pfizer. What are your thoughts about mixing and uh, mixing up and getting Moderna as the second booster? booster? So we did that study here and I, actually there's some benefit to probably mixing them. So I would, if you did Pfizer, you know, both the regular course and then a booster, I do the Moderna second booster. And if you have Moderna, I do the Pfizer second, the Pfizer second booster. So mixing and matching actually provides some benefit. Okay, what is the status of COVID vaccines that are variant specific? Well, you know, we've gone over the data for that a couple of times, but it's, it's surprisingly not much better than the standard vaccination. Not sure really why, but it's probably because the most important part of that spike protein is the part that binds to the cell, which is a very small part. And, and the, va the, the, the spike protein is changing and all this kind of stuff, but it's really the binding domain that, that counts the most. And so there hasn't been that much of a benefit from the uh, variant specific vaccines yet, but we'll see. There's still more data to come out. Are there any clinical trials on variant specific vaccines? Well, you're in luck. Baylor College of Medicine is, actually has several clinical trials underway. And if you want to participate, uh, the number is 713-798-4912. And we have been you know, leaders in the clinical trials on the mix and match uh, booster. So yes, I think it'd be great. So participate in a clinical trial. We'll all thank you for doing that. Uh, here's a good one. Should we get a booster for our seven year old? I'd say with the rising numbers, yeah, everybody who's approved for a booster should probably get a booster, including your seven-year-old. Uh, <laughs> do you think we'll be going back to masking in the fall? Uh, I mean, I, I, I hope not, but I would be prepared. I think there's a reasonable chance we'll see a surge in the fall, particularly you know additional mutants or variants coming along. Uh, what are the typical symptoms of Omicron versus Delta? Well, we talked about this before, but Omicron mostly replicates in the upper airways, so you get stuffy nose, sometimes a headache, cough. Whereas Delta, you got much more of a, a profound some pneumonia and, and loss, of, loss of taste, loss of smell. So uh, it's a little bit diff different. People sometimes report, you know, foggy feeling, dizziness, uh, but it's usually pretty self-limited illness right now be with all the all the vaccinations and the global immunity that we, I think we're beginning to see. Uh, will vaccination after having COVID reduce the risk of long COVID symptoms? Very good question. There was a study published in the British Medical Journal that looked exactly at this issue. And vaccination after infection was associated with a lower likelihood of having long COVID. So I would certainly do that. Uh, what should I do if I'm test positive for COVID with a home test? Do I need to call my doctor? Good question. Yes, it's a good idea for your doctor to know that you had COVID. Uh, there's not much else to do. Uh, you might discuss whether or not you need Paxlovid or something like that, but it'd be very good for him to have, or him or her, to have on your medical record that you had COVID. Do you think we'll still have a fall surge? <laughs> oh my God. I think we're in a summer surge. I think we're gonna have a surge this summer. I mean, it seems like the numbers are going up. So hopefully, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be better in the fall, but right now it's looking like, just like last August, we had a surge. I think we're heading towards a surge of the summer. This is a really interesting one. When someone says they were reinfected, is it the same infection or a new one? So it depends on the timing. So like the physician who asked me the question before, they were infected, they got symptomatic, took Paxlovid, then had a recurrence five days after they, I mean, right after they stopped taking Paxlovid, that's probably the same virus. So if you're, you know, it just, if it's within 10 days to two weeks or so, and you get recurrent symptoms, it's probably because you haven't cleared that same infection. But if it's three months later, probably almost certainly uh, uh, reinfected with a new variant uh, or a different variant. And, and right now, there are, remember, there are two major circulating variants of Omicron, the 12, the B.12 and the B.2. So those, you can get one and you can get the other one uh, months later. Uh, this is one I had to go look up. I saw a story that the flu vaccine could help prevent COVID. Is that true? Well, you know, I, didn't, I hadn't heard that, so I went and looked it up. And it, apparently, uh, there were some people who got vaccinated for flu, and during the very short period of time after their flu vaccine, there was a reduction in incidence in that group of, of COVID. And that makes sense. Once you, when your immune response is turned on, there's a lot of things that are not very specific, 
but all kinds of uh, cytokines that, are, that are inhibit viruses that float around. So you can imagine a non-specific benefit for a little bit, but still the only way to really be specifically uh, uh, benefited is to get a COVID vaccine and a flu vaccine for flu. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a good one. Should I, worried, should I be worried about my pets <laughs> contracting COVID? Well, we know a lot about COVID, right? It, it started off in bats, probably went to pangolins and then into humans. Uh, and now there are at least 20 other species that have been known to be infected. Big cats, ferrets, North American white-tailed deer, great apes, and a number of other uh, animal species. Only three species have gone from animal back to humans. The hamsters in Hong Kong, one report. Remember they closed the hamster store, the animal store in Hong Kong. Mink in Netherlands. The big mink farms has been decimating minks, but it does it had infected uh, mink handler. And then the white-tailed deer in the United States and Canada, I'm still trying to figure out how that guy got it from the white-tailed deer. No questions asked. Uh, but, you know, the concern, obviously, is that as it's in these other species, it begins to, you know, mutate and becomes a new reservoir. And so that is a big concern, which is why I've said we need a, a very strong surveillance program that looks at a lot of different animal species. Uh, okay, wondering what the best resource to track community spread is. Uh, now that the Texas Medical Center has stopped reporting data? Really good question, and this is important. The CDC, if you just go to cdc.gov, they've now put right on their landing page a, a county check. So you can type in your county and your state, and it will tell you the level of community spread, which is really what you should be uh, looking at to make decisions about whether or not you should be wearing masks, whether you, you know, if, or, or not. So, so for example, if it's low spread, uh, I, would, uh, I would not have any problem being indoors without a mask on. If it's moderate, I would start wearing masks indoor. And if I'm in a group of people, I went to the theater the other night, you know, I wear a mask. When I fly on an airplane, even though I'm the only one, I'm wearing a mask. All right. That's enough. <laughs> I can't take any more. I've got about 20 more questions, but we'll save it for another Q&A. I want to end today with a bunch of shout-outs because this week we had uh, gradu graduation. I want to congratulate all of our students that received diplomas this week. Uh, we know you're going to serve the, the country well, serve the community well, uh, and we'll be proud of you representing Baylor. We also are very proud of our three uh, medical students who were commissioned in the military uh, on graduation day. Amazing, not only are you serving your country, but you're serving uh, your fellow man. Just really fantastic. We're very proud of you. And of course, on Monday this weekend, we observe Memorial Day, where we remember the military uh, personnel who have died while serving the United States. Uh, we honor your service and respect you and, and your families for all the sacrifices you made for our country. So have a great week weekend. Have a wonderful Memorial Day. Janet, no more questions from your friends. Have a great weekend.